So we're very lucky. And these days, if I tell you that although this room might not be the largest, but we fit into this room, 20 plus guys, today I believe we had almost 30 guys, sitting and learning at the time where you wouldn't expect them to be found anywhere in the zip code. Yeah. We mentioned in the past that uh, we started a challenge with a few guys, trying to figure out if they would take off one hour of work a day to go in an hour later every day, and then at the end of the month to take a look and scale if they made anything less in their bottom line that month. We did this challenge with a few guys. And sure enough, at the end of the month, they came back and said, Rabbi, you lost the bet. I said, really, why? How's that? I said, well, the truth is that uh, we did not make the same as last month. I said, oh my gosh, how, many, how much are we off by? He said, well, the truth is we're not off. We didn't make less this month, we made more. I said, really? That's weird. Look at that. You worked an hour less a day, and you made more money this month? How did, how's that? He says, Rabbi, I don't know. We worked less, and we made more. So we decided to take the challenge the next month to the next step. We stumbled on a weird recipe. A recipe of uh, a little bit of an investment in a, bit, in a bitachon. So the next month, these guys, instead of going an hour later into work, they went two hours later into work, as you know the story. And then that month, they did even better. So they said, hey, we, we, we hit on something here. And from that point on, the group started to grow. We started with two guys. This goes back, I don't know how many months ago. And currently now, we're about almost close to 30 guys every, every morning. Instead of leaving at 8.15, like a bank robber, you ever see guys leave shore in the morning? Boom! It's like, a, it's like, <laughs> it's like the state police is after these guys. <laughs> right, right, right. It's like, <laughs> it's exactly, exactly, exactly. Chabobadi is a chitzavi brother. Used to make a joke. He says, "Hey, some people come in on a horse and leave on a horse. They enter shul and kibas usparo, and they leave ele barechem ele basusim." Ay, ay, ay. Well, Hashem, we got past that. <laughs> we got past that. Boy, boy, did we get past that. And now, Baruch Hashem, the guys aren't not, not just not out the door, but they sit on a proper breakfast in the morning. They come in. We sit shmuz for a few minutes. 9.15, which today became 9.05 because there was no, there was no Anna today. Right. We were early today, no Sefer Torah today, right? So we started 9.05 and we kicked off, unbelievable. And we had 30 guys. The first hour, Gemara Be'ayun, Rishonim Aharonim. The second hour, Beta Levi Bitachon. Now I want to tell you a little bit something about the piece we did this morning of the Beta Levi Bitachon because that is going to be that perfect segue to open up to the words that I really want to bring out today in regard to how a person prepares for Matan Torah. Now, if you guys remember it, this past Monday night, when we gave that first shiur on Shavuot, we talked about this concept of why Svirata Omer came before Shavuot. And the point was told in the name of the Chinuch is that you were supposed to count down to something you're looking forward to. We want you to look forward to the Torah. We want you to long for it. We want you to be thirsty for it. We want you to really, you know, anticipate the coming of Matan Torah. We don't want this to be another holiday that you show up on the day of the holiday and say, okay, I'm here, how do we celebrate? That, that's not what this holiday was about. This holiday needs major preparation. And the preparation of Matan Torah is the longing for it, is building up inside of yourself a wanting, to want to be able to come close to God through his Torah. Because that's the manual that he gave us to be able to become close to him. We mentioned this Raghachavar got on all the time where the Raghachavar was known to say, when I pray, I speak to God. And when I learn, God speaks to me. If you want Hashem to speak to you, you have to open up his Torah and jump in. And at that moment, you open a conversation with the greatest chavruta that money cannot buy. That's God himself. He's madrichu. He takes you by the hand. He walks you down the page. He opens your mind to incredible ideas, to questions, to answers, to things that you yourself didn't even know you were capable. And he makes it so sweet. Now, at first glance, you say to yourself, wait one second, Rabbi, I've been learning. 
And I didn't find it that sweet, yes. Like anything that has value in this world, there's always a beginning period that one needs to refine himself to the value and beauty of whatever it is that he's beginning of value. As a good example, any good wine connoisseur knows that if I would give a child, if I would give someone who doesn't know anything about wine tasting a thousand dollar bottle of wine, they would take it back and they'd spit it out. And you'd, you'd, you'd scream your head off. You just spit out 50 bucks. Do you know what you just spit out? That was a thousand dollar bottle of wine. But to this guy, his taste buds aren't yet ready for the finer things of life. Because his taste buds is still used to candies and sugar and sour sticks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That, 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 that's where he's holding. You know what I'm saying? You're going to go and give that guy a thousand dollar bottle of wine. He's not ready for it. it, it, it any, any good wine connoisseur will tell you, you need to develop the taste. Anything good in this world, I want you to know this well. Anything good in this world, it has a certain qualification period that one needs to develop the finer skills in order to appreciate the beauty of what he's about to acquire. Because if it comes easy, it goes easy. Torah doesn't come easy. But once you get it, it doesn't go easy either. <laughs> once you taste the real taste, everything else, everything else is artificial flavoring. Everything else. It's like, you know, you got to taste the real thing. This is not a Coke commercial. <laughs> this is not a Coke commercial. But once you taste the real thing, everything else tastes like ShopRite Cola. It tastes like Robitussin. Once you drink a Coke, it tastes like Ugh. Because you tasted the real thing. I told her the minute you taste the real thing and you break through that process and you actually taste the sweetness, I'm telling you, listen to me well, there's no going back. Rosh Shmuel Berenbaim used to say to the students of the Mir Yeshiva, he says, once you touch the doorknob of the Mir Yeshiva and you started tasting Torah, that's the point of no return. Once you've acquired that magnificent taste of learning, it's an enjoyment, it's a fulfillment that is so sweet. And I know that every year, this is incredible, every year, the night of Shavuot, I have a challenge for you tonight. Good one. Dave, you're going to love this. Every year, the night of Shavuot, at the end of the night, I always have a few guys that walk up to me and say, Rabbi, wow, that was the most amazing night of learning. I, I, I don't want it to end. I don't want to go to sleep. Can we do it again tonight? I'm looking at the guy. Hey, bro. <laughs> do, do you know how many hours of preparation? <laughs> Do you know how long it took me to cook that dish for you? Do you know how many hours of preparation it took for that four-hour shiur in the night of Shabbat from 12 to 4? Do you know how many hours? What do you think? What do you think? Rabbis are like slot machines. You put in a quarter and you pull the thing and when it just comes spit the hour. What do you think this is? We work for a living for heaven's sake, bro. Get with the program. But I love it. I love it. To me, it's, it's, it's like my Gan Eden in this world when at the end of that night, a guy who might not have been learning that much that year, but suddenly he like, he really tastes the sweetness. And he got such a magnificent taste. Oh, so here's the challenge, Dave. I told you a, a challenge. The challenge is that this year we got a crazy topic. Great topic. Great, yeah, Baruch Hashem. Hashem just sent it. <laughs> a great topic, amazing topic. The topic of this year's all night Shavuot learning is the Iron Dome of Israel. Wow, oh, wow, wow. wow. Come here. Wow, what, 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 a, what a shiur. There's going to be no one sleeping by us the night of Shavuot. I'm telling you straight up, we're talking about missiles. I mean, this is, this is missiles. This is missiles. Can we get a the preview. Okay, I'll give you a taster. I'll give you a taster. Just a taster. Taster. No, no, just a little taster. 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 I'll give you a taster. Okay? You might not know, but when Israel, when they use the Iron Dome technology, so the missiles that are coming in from the Arab countries, so the Iron Dome technology senses those incoming missiles, mm -hmm. and they're able with incredible accuracy and precision to hit and knock down those missiles. But what you guys don't know is that when they hit 
and knock down those missiles, those missiles explode in the air. Now, where does all that shrap metal go? Where does it go? It starts raining metal on different little uh, areas, towns, Moshav, Yishuvim, in Israel. And there have been casualties over the years during the Iron Dome usage, in other words, where that trap metal, which just took down a missile, which we don't know if that missile is going to hit a city or land in a field, but yet, when you blew it up and smashed it, now the trap metal is raining down on Jewish settlements. Are you allowed to knock down a missile that might land in a field? It might not, I agree with you. It's a suffix, we don't know. The Arabs over the years did not prove their precision and accuracy in their missiles. Thank God for that. That's, <laughs> that's all Hashem, by the way. It's not the Arabs. It's Hashem. It's Hashem. But nonetheless, are you allowed to knock down a missile that might land in a field, might not, knowing that it's going to start raining shrap metal on the citizens of Klal Yisrael with very possible fatalities? It's a great question. It's the suya of Chayech HaKodmin. Yeah. Who do we save first? Whose life is more important? Do we take the chance knowing that there might be real collateral damage? Or maybe you're not allowed to take that chance according to Halakha. That's a tremendous question. It's a tremendous shiur. I better see Marashli the night of Shabbat. I better see him. I love him. I watched him grow up since he was the age of seven years old. I have rights to say that life. I have rights. I have rights. I have rights. It's America. I have rights. This is America. I have rights. So let me tell you this amazing Bet Halevi that we did this morning. Now that I gave you the preview of the class of Shavuot night, very, uh, very uh, get up and dance type of uh, class. It's going to be a, it's going to be a bar brawl. I'm telling you, and, and that's what I love. I, I, I take pride in that because if we can get guys to dance the night of Shavuot in learning for four hours straight, where they won't even think of falling asleep, then we know we were Mikabel Torah this year, the Ahava. And that's the game plan. To make it sweet. To make it delicious. To make it enjoyable. To make it enjoyable. Guys, I want to tell you something. Torah is unbelievably sweet. It really is. It really is. The only difference is, you got to be able to taste it the way it was meant to be served. And if you didn't yet taste the sweetness of Torah, it's because you were frequenting the wrong restaurants. Find the right combination for you. I'm not plugging our kolel, although I am. <laughs> I am. I'll be honest, I am. Because listen, I'm going to tell you something. You know, the guys are here from 9 to 11.30 every day before they go out to work. And I could see that their phones are going off. I could see that every now and then they get an email of a meeting from a buyer or this or that. Or even sometimes the wives or someone in business is calling up with a question. It's very difficult. Huh? How do you stand up to that pressure? It's very hard. And people are calling on them in those two hours of the first hours of work day and saying, where are you guys? It's very hard. Especially on Monday morning. Oh, Monday morning where the week begins on that hour. Absolutely true. No, it's very true. It's very true. Very hard. Yeah, it is very hard. It's taught out with Mesirut Nefesh. It really is. But that's the sweetest of learning. When you've got to sacrifice for something and you have to give up for it, wow, the sweetness that comes out as a result is beyond this world. It's something to die for, really. Like the famous Reb Henoch used to say, the day you find something to die for is the day you begin to live. We found something to die for from 9 to 11.15, sometimes 11.30, every single day. And the guys sit in this room, and they sit, and they love it, and they don't want to leave. I see the looks on their face when the class is over. They're not darting out the door. They're saying, okay, Rabbi, thank you. Tomorrow, can't wait. Then I have to sometimes push them out. Sometimes I say, okay, go to work. <laughs> go, go to work. Hey, aren't you the Rabbi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, go to work. Yes, because that's how sweet it is. Ah. So let me read to you a piece of this Beta Levi we did in the morning. Because I think this is a good start and segue to where we should be going in preparation for the longing and the feelings of what we should be feeling coming into Matan Torah. 
Hashem says, if you want it, you'll fight for it. And this is amazing. In business, we know how to fight. We do. We go out there and we fight. In so many areas of gashmiut, in so many areas of the uh, pleasures of physicality, comforts of life, health, wealth, well-being, family, we know how to fight. But when it comes to spirituality, do we know how to fight for something of a spiritual growth that we know we really want? Have you seen people fight as hard for their spiritual wealth as they have for their monetary physical wealth? That's a great question. And that's exactly what we learned this morning in the Bet HaLevi when we went through it. You know, when it comes to business, everyone says, listen, I gotta go out, I gotta do my hishtadlut. I gotta do my hishtadlut. What type of hishtadlut do you gotta do when it comes to your Torah wealth? Your monetary wealth, we know. You gotta go out, you gotta give it your best shot, you gotta work honest, you gotta work hard, you gotta put in what you're able to do. The Bet HaLevi taught us when it comes to business, you do the norm and the necessary to profit in that business and then you remind yourself constantly that everything I'm putting in, at the end of the day, the results of the profit and success belongs only to Hashem. And it wasn't me who did this. I just went out and created a certain keli or a camouflage to make it look normal and natural so now God could drop down His miracles of wealth and success. That's what we've been talking about till now when it came to doing Ishtadlut in business. What about doing Ishtadlut when it comes to your learning? That's what this Bet Levi talks about tonight. Let me read it to you. We're reading from the footnotes of the Bet Levi, the Book of Bitachon. The footnotes was written by a great rabbi. His name is Harav Ferser, Shalita. He lives in Kiryat Sefer in, in, in Israel. Yeah, very special rabbi. We actually had a Zoom with him uh, a little over a month and a half, two months ago. And we got to meet him over Zoom. We're trying to work out to see if we can get him to give us classes once a week on Fridays. That would be really nice. If your Hebrew is good, Tfadel, it would be nice. But I want you to hear his words. He's the one who wrote these beautiful footnotes. Think about this. He says, Ulam, yesh lecha liodea shekol ma shehaamur hu klape inyaneha geshem vitzorche haolam hazeh. He says that there are two levels. The first level is the guy that goes out and he does his effort, his hishtadlut, in order to be matzliach in business, and then God blesses him. There's a higher level, he says, of someone who really worked on himself over the years, and this is somebody that he doesn't kind of tell God what he would like to happen, but he would accept everything that God brings and does to him in life as if he lets God know I know that you think and you know what's best for me I'm willing to accept everything you bring my way because you know what's best you love me and what's best for me you bring to me every day and therefore I have accepted desires of Hashem for me over my own personal desires this is a high level of bitachon Someone who accepts everything that Hashem brings them. Because they know that what Hashem is doing is their best. And therefore they wouldn't wish for anything else. Because if anything else would have been better, God would have brought that. And if He brought this instead, this must be the best for me. This is a very high level. Now listen to the way he puts this in words. He says the mashal is kitinok, like a young infant. She'en lo koratzon atzmi. He has no personal desires, the baby. Even when it comes to eating, the mother puts the food straight in his mouth. He says, he says when it comes to all these type of things, he says, when it comes to business, he says, the truth is that Hashem is really doing everything for us. We're just going through the motions. He's even putting the food in our mouth. We have to realize that it's going to come to a point in life that even the hishtadlut, even the efforts that we go out to do, even that is Hashem. He says, however, When it comes to your Torah growth, you can't sit back and say, I have bitachon that tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up and know the entire Masechet Shabbat in my head backwards and forwards. 
It doesn't work that way. You can have bitachon from today till tomorrow. If you don't go out and do it, if you don't go out and work, if you don't go out and learn that gemara, you're not going to know it. Ela alav la'asot kechol yichoto v'kocho. It's on the person to go out and do his complete strength, talent, efforts in order to be able to learn Torah. Shaharezeh gufa ratzon haboreh kefi shodiyah b'toratoh sheyatzeh mitzvah leplonit ubo hadavar taloi. This is an amazing idea, he says. He says, listen, people think that when it comes to business, I got to go out and do. When it comes to Torah, I rely on God. He says it's just the opposite. When it comes to business, you got to rely on Hashem. When it comes to Torah, spiritual stuff, you got to go out and do. We have, it the, we have it backwards. We have it wrong, he says. It's amazing. And the truth is, the more you grow in life, the more you see how true this idea is. That we go out and everything we do, the deals that we worked hard for at the last minute, slip away. And the deals that we didn't work hard for, somehow or other, slip right into our pocket. Hashem shows us time and time again that the one you thought was going to come through and at the last second, didn't. And the one that so by chance, haphazard, happened to have fell in your lap, and that's the deal that you're living on. And that's God's way of saying, hey, I'm doing it for you. I got your back. I'm covering you, taking care of you. I'm putting the food in your mouth. We think that when it comes to business, we got to go out and do. When it comes to Torah, that I rely on God for. It's the opposite. When it comes to business, that I rely on God for. When it comes to spirituality and Torah, that's where you got to be a fighter. You got to go out and do. You got to go out and learn. You got to initiate. Those are the areas that Hashem tests us. He says, I want to see you want it. I want to see you ready to fight for it. Because if you really want learning and you want to fight for it, I'll give it to you in the sweetest of way. But it has to come from you first. We have it backwards. Everyone thinks by the business, I got to go out, I got to do, and I got to turn over the world, and I'm going to work extra hours, and I'm going to kill myself, and I'm going to be workaholic, and I'm going to hustle. You ever hear those guys? I'm going to hustle, and I'm going to break my back until I... Buddy, 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 grow up. Grow up. Open your eyes. Realize how many times you went out and killed yourself for a deal for six months. And at the last minute, something happened. Poof. And then you have another deal that you hardly did anything for. It literally fell in your lap. It literally was a phone call away where Hashem just kind of picked it up from one place and dropped it on you from another place. And that deal you did so well on and you were so much sliach that that's what's carrying you. And you start to scratch your head and realize that, wait one second, what really is my role here? I'm basically managing God's affairs. <laughs> That's really what it is. I'm, I'm, watching the, I'm watching the pieces move on the board, and I'm just moving with them. Basically, we have it backwards. We thought that we need to go out and fight and kill blah, 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 to make it in business. Torah? No, I sit back and I say, okay, Rabbi, inshallah, I'll come to class and let me hear what you say. Okay, Baruch Hashem Le'olam, Amen ve'amen, Kaddish. And the guy just says Kaddish on his own Torah future. We have it backwards. It's in the business that Hashem, we rely on Hashem completely. And when it comes to the spiritual Torah, we don't rely on anybody except for our efforts and hishtadlut. Hashem says, I want you to do this. I want you to fight for your learning. I want you to be a fighter when it comes to learning. I want you to give it your all. Do you know that when it came time for Yaakov Avinu to go down to Egypt, he sent one of his sons ahead in order to build that yeshiva in a place called Goshen in Egypt. Now which son do you think Yaakov Avinu would send down to build the yeshiva? Well, at first glance, you would say maybe Reuven. He's the oldest and the most capable, right? Maybe you would say Shimon. Shimon's a powerhouse. He wiped out the whole city of Shechem. 
Maybe you'd say Levi, because Levi later on is going to be the guy that's going to run the Bet Hamikdash. So when it comes to all spiritual matters, somehow or other, Levi is involved. And by the way, Levi was the tribe that ended up learning Torah in those 210 years in Egypt. So if someone's going to use the yeshiva, you might as well send down the tribe that's going to use it. Let them build the yeshiva. And yet, when it came time to send the son down, he did not send Reuven to build the yeshiva in Egypt. He did not send Shimon. He did not send Levi either. He did it. You know, he sent Dave. He sent Yehuda. Not in Yisachar, who his place is, the Lombe Torah. Very good point. He sends Yehuda. Why does he send Yehuda? What does Yehuda have to do with Yeshiva? What does he have to do with Yeshiva? Okay, later on, the kings are going to come from Yehuda. All right, so time to build a castle. We'll send Yehuda. But we're building Yeshiva. Why are you sending Yehuda? Send Levi. Reuven. Shimon, Yisachar, answers the Rashiva of the Mir Yeshiva, Rav Shmuel Birnbaum, Zechet Sadiq Lebracha. He says, from here you see, that when it comes to building Torah, you need a Gibor. Because to build Torah is a war, it's a fight, it's a fight, it's a fight, it's a fight, it's a fight. Yaakov Avinu knew the Milchemet Hashem, the fight of learning. He knows that the Yitzhahara will fight you harder on your Torah learning than anything else in your life. Chesed, he'll let you do chesed. He'll let you. Tefillah, usually, and now and then, he'll let you pray also. But when it comes to Torah, that's the kryptonite. That's his weakness. And that's where he draws the line. And he'll do whatever he can. The minute a guy sits down for five minutes in the, in the morning and he opens a Gemara, his phone starts ringing off the charts. All of a sudden, the entire world needs this guy. Everybody, his wife, his mother, the guys in the office, the guy that's supposed to be opening the store doesn't show up. The pizza man that makes the pizza doesn't show up. Everybody that's important to this world doesn't show up. Why? Because he sounded the alarm. You know what the alarm is? He opened the Gemara. All of a sudden, ding, 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 ding. Yitzhak Hara says, holy smoke, this guy opened the Gemara. Quick, guys, everybody, jump him. Mug him. It's a mugging. It's a mugging. It happens every morning, Monday morning at 9 o'clock. It's a, it's a mugging. Everybody, stop. Whatever you do, stop him. For, and, and Chafetz Chaim writes that the Yitzhak is even willing to send mitzvot to the guy to do. Just don't learn. Because in Shamayim, he knows the score. He knows, Ner mitzvah v'torah or. He knows that a mitzvah is like the light of a candle, but the light of Torah is the light of the sun. Did you ever try to raise up a candle against the sun? Good luck with that. So the Yitzhahara says, I'll give you 10 cents on a dollar any day of the week. That, no, that, 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 that's exactly what he's doing. It's exactly what he's doing. I'll trade you 10 cents for a dollar. Any day of the week. Just close the Gemara and go out and help this guy. I'm telling you, and, and, and this is a daily phenomenon. We see this in our lives all the time. In order to build Torah, you need a gibor. That's what Shmuel Birnbaum said. That's why he did not send Reuven, not, not even Levi. He sent Yehuda. Yehuda was an Ari. He was an Ariyeh. He was a lion. He was the powerhouse. He was the gibor. He was the one that stood up to Yosef. Little did he know it was Yosef. But he was the one that was ready to wipe out the whole Egypt to bring Binyamin back. That's a gibor. It's a gibor. When it comes to Torah, you got to go with your strongest strength forward. Because, forgive me for the Hebrew, atatzarich liot, fighter. Huh? What do you think about the Hebrew, huh? Fighter. Huh? That's, that's a wild Hebrew word, no? Right? Like jeepim and tankim, right? No, these are Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew. Hebrew, I'm talking to you, Hebrew. Dave, you don't understand one word I'm talking about. I know that. I don't know, you don't get one word I'm talking about. Atatzarich liot, fighter. When it comes to learning, you have to be a fighter. You have to be, a, to be matzliach, you have to be stubborn, and you have to be a fighter. And you have to want it, and you have to go out and fight for it, and no one else can do it for you except you. Nobody. And just, like, just because your father's Rosh Hashiva does not mean the son knows beans. This is not something that comes be Yerusha. This does not come with a certain inheritance of the genes. The ones that learnt, no. And the ones that did not learn, don't know. There's the special effects for you. <laughs>
Thank you, Borei Olam. That was timing. <laughs> Impeccable. That was perfect, perfect timing. But this is the truth. This is what we're finding about China. This is what we just learned from Harav Ferser in the Beit Levi. He says, everyone thinks that when it comes to business, I've got to go out and do Hishtadlut. He says, it's the opposite. When it comes to business, you completely rely on God. When it comes to Torah, you've got to do Hishtadlut. That's where the Hishtadlut is. Hashem wants to see, are you ready to fight for it? Are you ready to work for it? Are you ready to put your best foot forward? Are you ready to go out and fight for it? And learn? It takes a tremendous drive and a fighter to succeed in learning. Because there's going to be a lot of times where they try to knock you down. And you've got to be that fighter, Rocky, that's able to get back up and go another round. Another round. I'm not giving up. Until I succeed, I'm not giving up. That's what Torah is about. That's what Torah is about. That's the way you matzliach and Torah. A lot of good guys came and a lot of good guys went. And many of them were very intellectually advanced. It's not always the smartest guy in the class that becomes the real Talmud Chacham. I could be made. Believe me, if you would have sat in my class in high school, you wouldn't believe the sense of humor that God has today. I'm telling you. The guys that the Rebbe's thought were going to be the future Roshivas, don't get me wrong, very bright individuals, very bright, very smart guys. And today they're very successful. Doctors and lawyers, they are, and God bless them. And they're real B'nai Torah, they're living a beautiful Jewish life. But they did not become the Rabbanim of Klal Yisrael. It wasn't the guy that was smart that made it. It was the guy that refused to lay down and give up. He's the guy that made it learning. And this is what we need to know before Matan Torah. Borei Olam says, are you ready to fight for it another year? How much do you want it? Because how much you want it is how much I'll give it to you. But it's all the fi your ratzon. That's what Torah is all about. It's the ratzon. How much do you want it? We got to be a gibor. So let me tell you this amazing story. Oh boy. I hope this story does not, does not shed a certain light or draw a different picture of the speaker than one that you came into. Many years ago, when I was learning in Yeshivat Itri in Yerushalayim, it was right that first year when I got to Israel. I went to the Mir Yeshiva of high school. I went out to Yeshivat Edison one year out of town by my Rebbe, my first, my first Rebbe. Ah, Rebbe Roshachar, Shalita, Hashem Shablesu, Arichut Yamim Mishranim, how I loved him, how I still love him. I did something a little bit drastic while everybody else, second said there in Bet Midrash, was doing a different pedek. I went back, and all I did the entire second Seder was Chazarat Hashir of the morning's Shi'ur. And my Rebbe Rebberl, because he lived in Lakewood, stayed in the yeshiva in one of the offices, second Seder. So I would actually knock on that door of his office, sometimes even ten times in a second Seder, just to go over with him his share again and again and again. Until I got it, until I got it in my sleep. We learned Masechet Ba Metziah. That Masechet became one of my favorite Masechetot because of that first year of real learning. I had to go out of town to start really learning. Here in Brooklyn, there were way too many distractions as I'm about to tell you the story I'm about to tell you. So after that year in Edison, I went out that summer to Eretz Yisrael as a vacation, just for a few weeks. And I ended up finding the yeshiva of my dreams. I have ended up finding Yeshivat Itri. I fell in love with the Yeshiva, with the Rosh Yeshiva. The rabbis there, to me, were like nothing I've ever seen. Diane Fisher, Reb Simcha Shif, Shalita. Many of the greats that I let later on bumped into, Rabbi Elephant, of course, the personality of the generation. <laughs> wow. It was, it was a big experience for me. And I called up my father and I pleaded with him, please let me stay. Now, I went on vacation. I didn't go to learn. I went there with a suitcase filled with sweatpants and t-shirts. It's not exactly the way you show up to a Bet Midrash, not, not even close. The only thing that I had that actually looked Bet Midrash material was my Shabbat suit, that's it. I actually walked into the yeshiva with my Shabbat suit because I'm not gonna show up to a Bet Midrash in sweatshirt and, 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 and t-shirts. I ended up wearing that suit for the next month. <laughs> Every single, I don't know else, until they sent me my clothes. I had nothing else. I had nothing else. 
But I called my father and I cried over the phone. I begged him. I begged him. I begged him with my entire heart. I said, Abba, I'm begging you, please. 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 Let me stay here. Let me stay here and learn. I found the yeshiva that to me was off the charts. I was re- learning with Rabbi Nassim Kamenetsky, Rabbi Yaakov's son, second Seder Havruta. I was learning with Diane Fisher Havruta at night in his room, which is a whole story in itself. I didn't want to leave. So he let me stay. And then after Sukkot, I went back for the winter's month and I started to learn. And this was a learning that was something out of this world. But I had an issue, I had a problem. At that time, my father was going through a little bit of a financial tough time. And I don't know if you guys understand, we come from a generation that's very different than today. The way we grew up, we didn't want to ask our parents as a burden for anything. I am telling you, if you would know to the extent that I'm talking to you now, I am telling you there was a point that year that I was washing my laundry in the sink of the bathroom of the yeshiva because I didn't have money to send out to the cleaners like maybe most of the American guys learning in Israel. Now, I could get away with it because I was in an Israeli yeshiva and because of that, not everything needed to be French pressed and tucked. But, but, nonetheless, from what I was used to and from what I came from, the sacrifice for me at that young age of 19 was a big pill to swallow. I was doing my laundry by hand, because there was no machines in the yeshiva. All the Israeli boys went home for Shabbat, and they brought their laundry home to their parents. I was a chutzniya, an American kid, in an Israeli yeshiva, with a lot to get used to, including suppers. I'll never forget that first supper in an Israeli yeshiva. I walked into the dining room, and there was a plate of corn niblets at the middle of the table. I sat down, I grabbed the plate, and pulled it towards me, and I was about to dig in and start eating. All of a sudden, I feel eight guys over my shoulder shadowing me. I spin around. What in the way? I felt like I was about to get mugged in Harlem. I mean, this was a, 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 a ma'idchem. Oh, uh, yeah. My Hebrew at that time wasn't so great, but the few words I knew. Ma'idchem. They start yelling at me. Ma'atachoshara. I said, Ma'ma kara. I said, Atalakachta tatzalacha. I said, Kena, di bati rishon. What's the problem? I came first. I get the first plate. He said, No, that's not the first plate. That plate's for the whole table. The whole table. One plate of corn niblets? Yeah! I said, I was a mana echat. It's okay, but America is a mana echat. That's for the whole table. I said, holy moly, how in the world am I going to survive this place? That's what they serve? That's supper. Actually, that's supper. That was Thursday night supper. I didn't know the system. I didn't know the system. All these guys with their peeler things, with their, with their vegetables standing on the side, eating vegetables and corn niblets. Who can live on vegetables and corn niblets? But that's what they served in the yeshiva. As an American, could you survive on that? I said, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm going go, go to I'm gonna go to Massive at that time. That was the shawarma place by Dachan Amikazi. I'm going to go, I'm going to get myself a shawarma. I'm going to eat like, a, like the way an American knows how to eat. I was having a hard time adjusting that first few months. And especially with no money, I would not ask my father for a nickel. I know it would hurt him more if he couldn't give. I just couldn't do it. So I never asked him for a thing. When I was away in Israel, what he gave me, he gave me, and that's that's it. We grew up in a generation that we would never put any pressure on our parents. We were protective over our parents. We were very protective over our parents. We felt that we needed to do for them, if anything. If anything. The Ben Shushan table on a Shabbat night, me and my brothers, when we sat around the table, we wouldn't touch the food on a Friday night meal until my father ate first. It was unheard of. It was like, it, it wasn't a Hava Amina. We would wait for my father to take from that first salad, right? The Moroccans have what's called tuktuka. It's this red salad that you wipe up here, like a, it's, it's, it's a Friday night. It's a, oh my gosh, my mother. <laughs> Hashem shall bless Arichut Yamim. She made that, oh, wow. Till today my wife is trying to get it straight. It, it's, it's a tuktuka. That, no one touched the tuk until my father took. Sometimes my father wasn't even up to eating it, but he just took a little piece just to know because no one's touching it until you take something. He took from it, we took. You had the Moroccan avocado salad with the mustard, he took from it, we took. The hot silim, he took from it, we took. And, and, and if not, we wouldn't touch it. Nothing would move on the table until he takes. It's a different generation, it's a different generation, different times. 
very protective over our parents. We felt that we owed them the world because we did. We did. We owed them the world. They gave their lives for us. We were makirit. We had hakaratatov, and we knew it. It's something that today's generation is struggling with the concept of hakaratatov. But that generation that we came from, wow. And therefore you understand, I would not call him and put him in a tough position to ask for more money, whether he had it or not. So I said to myself, you know what? I'll do a little something on the side. Make a few bucks. And like this, I'll be my own self-funder. Hmm. I know who I'm pointing to. I'll be my own self-funder. I'll fund my own project, my own learning. Well, I'll make a few bucks on the side. Bain has darim. Weekends. Like this, I'll have some money for the, for the laundry. I'll show them every now and then. Like this, I can keep up you know, with the boys and meet up with them every now and then. And that's it. And then I can go and I can learn with some hatachayim. So I'm thinking to myself, okay. So I'm looking inside, asking myself, what talents do you have? What talents do you have? What can you use that can make a few bucks? Now, I will tell you, it's a little bit embarrassing. It's not a little bit. It's very embarrassing to tell you what I'm about to tell you now. I'm sorry. <laughs> forgive me. I, be I, really, I, be I beg of your forgiveness. Understand that I, I'm past the age of 40. Let's put it that way. And the kufa that I'm explaining to you now was when I was 19. So please, don't judge me today in the eyeglasses of a 19 American boy that just came to Israel to start really learning, okay? I really thought that I was going to be the next Bruce Lee. I, 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 forgive me for saying that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. But we, listen, in the 80s, in the 80s, we grew up with the martial arts. I'll be honest with you. We grew up with Chuck Norris. We grew up with Bruce Lee, Steven Seagal. We, that's what we grew up with. And forgive me. At I'm telling you straight. I'm coming clean. Telling you straight. I had this thing for the martial arts. I was that nut job that did 150 upside down sit ups every night on a bar that hung in my bedroom. I was that guy. And I trained very hard. Baruch Hashem, I guess. Knowing the other Yetzir Harot that were out there, this was my Mishagas. Thank God this over other things, you know, other things could have taken in different places. But this was my craziness. I had that juke in the head. I had the juke in the head. Part of the reason why my father was okay with me staying in Israel and learning with Israel is because he wanted me to get away from all that world of distraction. Because at the age of 17, I turned black belt, I went out to tournaments, and I got really good, and I started getting drawn. There's a world out there that's drawn, mamisha. And that was here, he sent me out of town. That's why he sent me out of town to Edison, to get me away from Brooklyn, to get me away from, from, from the whole craziness. And now Israel. The idea was to keep me far away from that whole world. But I said to myself, but this is what I can do in order to make a few bucks. And what's the big deal? I'll go out to Harnov. That's where all the American Aliyah kids are. I'll make a little chug, they used to call it in Israel, this little club. It was a martial arts club. It was a self-defense club. Every kid, it's good for them to know growing up a little, a little bit of how to defend themselves so they're not just the next kid's pushover. Show them just a few moves, a few classes. I made the cheshbon. There's the accountant in me. 20 kids, 50 shekel a month. It's 1,000 shekel. In, the, in, in those years, in the 90s, when I started in Israel my first year, 1,000 shekel was pretty good money for a guy, single guy, who's sitting and learning. Forget it. 1,000 shekel, you're a prince. You're a prince. Forget about laundry, if you shawama. Now you're, you're, you're buying shawama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're buying shawama. You're, you're buying shawama for the whole camera. What, now you're the funder. You're, 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 you're the boss, right, Marisha? You're the boss. You're the boss. I could have been a boss and learning. Boss and learning. Oh, great. But on the other hand, I did say to myself, this is my year to learn. And this is my opportunity to really fight for the Torah that I never had before. This is the place that I came to run away from that world, to get away from those distractions. Does Torah go hand in hand with other things that you love as well? Or maybe, maybe Torah is like a wife, and a wife will never stand for any other love in your life except for her. There is no wife on the planet that's willing to play second fiddle to any other love in their husband's life. The Torah is the same way. The Torah 
like a wife, is not willing to take second position to something that you have a greater love for other than her. And if you really want to become great in Torah, you've got to be married to it, like a wife. And this was my quandary. What do I do? On one hand, I've got to give it my all. I've got to be ready to fight for it. No distractions. That's what I finally got away from everything for. On the other hand, Mandi flus. I have nothing. I have no money. I have no money. I, 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 I need, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm, you think I'm exaggerating. You think I'm exaggerating. I was washing the Shabbat shirts in the sink on Fridays, putting whisk on the collars, scrubbing, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, telling, you, I'm telling you, I went to the Amish country on this one. I was, I, was, I was rubbing the collars, I took the dripping wet shirt, brought it Friday afternoon after a Mishmar night of learning, hang, hung it, Hung it, if there is such a word, hung it, because people you hang, shirts you hung, right. hung it on the, uh, the tris, on the top of the tris, that was on the windows, right by the curtains, I hung it on the bar of the curtain, and then I took the stender in my room, took the blow heater, put it on the stender, plugged it in, and literally navigated the blow heater up against the shirt to have it, hopefully, dry in time for Shabbat. And on those early Shabbats, I walked in Friday night with a damp... Everyone has their thing. <laughs> my thing, one of my things, A, I cannot deal with crumbs in the bed. I can't deal with that. I have sensory issues. I can't deal with the crumbs in the bed, and I cannot deal with damp clothing against my skin. I'm telling you, I, they were testing. They were testing me. And they were Friday nights that I came into yeshiva with a damp shirt, and I was like, I was walking like the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz, I'm telling you, I was, and it was so uncomfortable, but I would not call my father and ask him. This is what I gotta do for learning. So I had a big question. Do I do something on the side and learn with a slight distraction, or maybe Tyra is Tyra is Tyra, it's a wife, it's your only love, no distractions, what do I do? I decided to do what every good Jew should do at the moment of quandary. Go to the Abishta, go to Abba. Go to Abba, go to Abba. So I'll never forget that day. That day I went out to Meir Shadim and I jumped on the number one bus. The number one bus on the way to the Kotel, ripping its way through the narrow streets of Meir Shadim, as if the guy is driving down Ocean Parkway. The guy is going top speed with the side winders of those uh, side mirrors mm -hmm. scraping up against the brick and you see the sparks these guys are unbelievable these guys and I'm on that bus and I was the first stop so I walked onto an empty bus on the way to the Kotel to ask Hashem this question what do I do what do I do and this guy is ripping through the streets stopping by different stops and just then this very large guy gets on the bus now the bus was empty I'm talking empty. It was me and maybe another person in the front. But the entire bus was empty. A hundred seats to pick from. Where do you think this guy came to sit down? He comes to the back of the bus where I'm sitting on a two-seater. He walks by 50 empty seats. And this guy, I'm talking, when I tell you this guy was large, I'm talking about this guy was large. He must have been three to four hundred pounds. He was huge. The guy turned around and I heard the backup I heard the backup sound, e, 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 e. and I was like, no, no, and he backed up, and he came down, ba-boom, and my whole seat went up, and he went down, and I was e, stuck between him and the wall, and I'm looking at this guy, the bus is empty, you could have taken a row for yourself. What are you doing? Sitting right up against me. And I'm telling you, his thigh was on my thigh. It, it, was, it, was, it was horrible. It was horrible. I was rubbish like against the glass. And I said, hi. And he looks at me with a smile. He says, are you from here? And I knew he was American. He had the camera hanging over the thing. And he had the, uh, the, 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 the paper, cardboard, Kotel yarmulke on. And, 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 and he looks at me with a smile. He says, you from here? And I said, yeah. He says, so what are you doing here? I said, I'm learning here in yeshiva. Oh, you're here in yeshiva? I said, yeah. He says, wow, I want to tell you something. Whatever you do, don't stop 
learning. I'm looking at this guy. I said, excuse me, what did you just say? <laughs> I mean, where did that come from, really? I mean, you would have seen it. I'm doing a guy with a t-shirt, members only t-shirt, camera hanging, right? I'm talking typical here, right? The khaki pants, dock siders with no, uh, what's it called, with, you know, without, without, without the slacks. And this big guy, really big guy. And, and he looks at me with the cardboard keeper, and he says, you're in yeshiva. Listen to me. I want to tell you something. Whatever you do, don't stop learning. I was like, wow. You know, <laughs> we didn't even get to the hotel yet. Right. <laughs> We're on the bus. And he says, I want to tell you my story. Now, the truth is, I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was pinned to the wall. <laughs> and he had a captivated audience because I was literally. And I said, okay. And this is what he tells me. He says, years ago, I was a young boy in Europe. He says, I was a... Uh, in a small town outside of, he told me, whatever city it was. And he says his dad was a very religious man, maybe even a rabbi. The way he described him, he didn't call him a rabbi, but he described him as what would sound like a rabbi, very religious man. Someone who actually had a big hand in the spirituality of what was going on in that small town. He used to teach, used to teach Torah. He says one day his dad comes home and he tells him, my son, listen, you're young. You're only 15 years old, but you're strong. You're big. You could do very well. I put a small fortune away over the last few years. I bought you a ticket. I'm sending you to the United States of America, the land that flows milk and money. I'm going to send you there. You're going to work. I have an uncle there who's going to help you. He's in Chicago. You're going to find him. You're going to work and you're gonna send us back money. And with that money, me and your mother and your brothers, we're gonna be able to come to America and meet up with you. He had a whole plan, he had a whole plan. And he says, I was so happy because I heard about America. As a young boy, you hear about the celebrities in Hollywood. I said, what way? He says, this was way back in the 50s. And he said to him, this was something, wow. An opportunity to be the one to bring the family over. And he says, my father was relying on me and my parents and my, my everyone. And they made me a big party the night before I left. And then the next day, my father took me over to his room and he was sitting against his sperm shank, he told me. And he says, he told me, my son, listen to me. Whatever you do, remember, you're a Jew. Don't chas v'shalom let any of the world's winds blow you away in your Judaism. Shabbat is unnegotiable. When it comes to eating kosher, unnegotiable. Don't ever miss a day at tefillin. And he says, he gave me such a schmooze, telling me that more than ever, more than anything, I should keep my Judaism, more than anything. And I said, Dad, of course, what's the question? And he says, that afternoon, they all took me out to the docks. I got onto the ship, and we were on our way to the United States. And I remember my mother crying, and my father was waving me and smiling with such pride. And he says, the ship pulled out of the harbor. He says, we were at, we were at sea for about four or five days. And the captain announced that we're going to be stopping off the shores of a certain small town off of Romania. And he says, we're going to be stopping there for one night just to give everybody a little bit of a break of the voyage. And he says, I was happy. I wanted to get off the boat. I was a little bit seasick, he tells me. And he says, when we pulled into the docks off the shores of Romania, he says, everybody went into the town to go looking around. He says, I didn't have anybody with me. I was a kid. All I had was a few dollars that my father gave me. So he says, I didn't have where to go. And I had no one to be with. He said, I was nervous to go into the town. I wanted to stay near the ship to know I don't miss it the next day when it pulls out midday. Because the dock captain announced that anyone who doesn't come back on the boat by midday tomorrow, you snooze, you lose. You don't show up back to the boat, it's going to leave with out you. And he says, that night, I just walked up and down the docks. And he says, later on that night, I heard yelling and screaming and cheering coming from one of the bars all the way down the docks. So I decided, as a curious young boy, to go and find out what's going on. So he says, I went down the docks, and I came up to this bar. I walked inside, and... Everybody was drinking in the back of the bar was the yelling and the cheering and the screaming. And I was trying to make out what's going on back there. 
What's the big hallabaloo? He says, I made my way to the back and I saw that there was a circle of men. And in the middle of the circle, something was going on that everyone was screaming and cheering about. And every now and then, they would throw up these papers. Half the people would scream and cheer. The other people would walk away with a sorrow face. And I didn't know what was going on. He says, I, had to, I, I was curious. I had to see. I had to see what was going on. So I squeezed my head in between the arms of a few men just to take a look at the middle of this circle. What's the big thing going on? And he says, I saw two guys beating each other's heads in, fighting, but such a ruthless, it wasn't boxing. It was a fight till they knocked out the other guy. And then I realized that this taller guy, he must be the champion because he keeps knocking everybody out. And it seems that they're playing, placing bets of money on who could be able to stand for how long in front of this big guy. And this guy was a bruiser, this champion. He keeps knocking out one after the next. I was like, wow. And every time he knocked out somebody, they threw up the papers. They you know, raised his arm in the air while other people walked away losing their money. He says, this was amazing to me. I've never seen something like this before in my small hometown where I came from. And he says, just then. He says, I don't know where these pair of hands came from, but a pair of hands came right up behind him and pushed him into the middle. And he says, I found myself looking right at this killer of a guy, this monster of a guy. And he says, he was two heads taller than me. He says, I was really strong as a kid and I looked much older than I really was. And he says, I was, I was, I was, I was well built. But I couldn't go up against this guy. This guy's a professional fighter. He's a killer. He says, but just then, I turned around and tried to run out screaming. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. And they wouldn't let me out of the circle. And no matter what side of the circle they tried to go out, they threw me back. Everyone was led. They thought it was a big game. It was funny as can be. And they kept pushing me back in and pushing me back in until I realized I'm not getting out of this circle unless I fight. He said, I had no choice. He says, I turned around. I was looking at this guy dead straight into the kneecap. This guy was much taller than me. I didn't know what to do. And just then, the guy started coming after me. I realized I was the next victim. He says, well, what do you think I did as a kid, 15 years old? He says, I started running for my life. I was running around in the circle and I tripped. And the guy who was coming after me tripped over me and he landed right on the side of his head. And he was dazed on the floor for a minute. He says, at that minute, he says, this was my moment of opportunity. It's like, you know, it's like haba lahor gecha, hashkem lahor go. This guy's coming to kill me. I better do something quick before he gets off the floor. He says, I jumped on top of the guy just to keep him down. And I started punching him until his eyes closed. And he says, I don't know what happened at that minute. The whole crowd throws up the papers. They grabbed me and they raised me in the air and they start screaming, our new champion. He says, what happened? Champion, I'm a 15-year-old Jewish kid trying to get to the United States to make a few dollars to bring my parents over from my hometown to America. And suddenly I became the Romanian champion. He says, they handed me a wad of bills so thick for that one mistake fight. I didn't know what to do with myself. And then the next challenger comes in and he says, wait one second. Now I gotta defend the title. What did I get myself into? He says, the next guy came in. I had no choice. I fought him. I didn't know my own strength. In a matter of a minute or so, I knocked him out. They picked me up again. They handed me another lot of bills. He says, I was looking at these bills. He says, there was more bills in that 30 second fight than my father made all year back in our hometown. So I, I, I said to myself, wait, I'm better at this than I realized. You know, if I just do a few of these, I don't have to go to America. I'll make enough money one night. I could be on the ship back to my hometown, buying tickets for my whole family and bring them home, and I don't have to go through the whole process. He says, at that minute, I got into the groove, put the money away, and I started to fight. And I knocked out one guy after the next guy, after the next guy. He says, that night, I knocked out four guys. I was undefeated. I was a champion. They gave me vodka to drink on the house. He says, never, I don't know, no one ever gave me vodka to drink before. They were raising me in the air, I was a champion. He says, the next day, I woke up late. 
And I came back and I said to myself, you know what? Let me just find out. I asked the guy in the bar. He says, oh, the champion's here. Tonight, you're going to make even more. We know we are amazing. I said, but wait, we're sp I'm supposed to, two hours, I'm supposed to pick up the boat to the United. He says, listen, why do you have to go to the United States? You'll make more money here for your family than anything you'll ever do for, what, two cents on the hour that you're going to be making. Stay here. And if you don't like it, you catch the next boat. They come all the time. You pick up the next boat. He says, so I stayed. And that afternoon I watched as the ship that I came in on left without me. Ah, the eight Sahara. <laughs> I'm a champion. I'm wearing the golden belt. He says, that night I fought. And I fought like a champion. And I knocked out another three guys. And I made so much money that night. And they showed me that I was able to rent a room right off the harbor, beautiful room overlooking the water. And I had all the money. And I started to fight. And he says, this went on for months. And I met a Romanian girl. I stopped putting on tefillin. I stopped keeping Shabbos. I stopped eating kosher. Nah, that's old. I'm a champion. I'm a champion. He says, this went on for a few years. He says, I became very wealthy. He says, I actually lived with this girl. And that was it. He says, and then the day came. After a few years of being the Romanian bulldog, as they nicknamed him, the champion of the docks, one night, he says, some kid comes walking into the bar with that same sheepish young look that I had a few years back. And he too was thrown into the middle, standing in front of me, and he had the fear in his eyes the way I was scared. And he was fighting out of fear, and he hit me with a punch that I did not see coming. And he dropped me. And I heard the yelling and screaming. And I looked up for a moment and I saw that it wasn't me that they were picking up. It was him. And they were screaming, our new champion. He says, I barely made my way out. I was bleeding from the side of my head. I made it back to the apartment. He says, my wife, girlfriend, I don't know, whatever you call, cleaned me up. And she says, that's it. No more fighting for you. He says, but, but how am I going to sustain this lifestyle? He says, I decided the next day, with the money I had left, I'm going finally to America. I was derailed by a few years, he told me. Small delay, but I'm going to get back on track. And I took her with me. I took her with me because I thought I loved her. And I brought her with me to the United States. And then I moved into the Lower East Side and I started working small jobs with the few dollars that I had left from my glory days. And then I sent the telegram to my father, Abba, Tate. I made it to America. And I got a telegram back because now they have my address. What happened to you? I was worried sick. I thought you died. Your uncle was looking for you. Everyone was looking for you. What happened the last few years? And I wrote back, Tate, I'll explain. I'm sending you some money for a ticket. And my father sends me back. I'm coming to visit you, my son. I want to make sure you're alive. He says, a month later, the boat comes into the harbor right in front of Lady Liberty. And my father gets off the boat. And I was standing there with my wife, waiting to greet him. I didn't see him for years. And oi, did he age. I remember he told me, oi, did he age. And he came off the boat, and he walked right past me. And I said, Tate, it's me. It's your son, Avramel. I don't know if that's what it is. I don't remember what his name was, his Hebrew name. He said, Avramel, your son. He said, he walked right past me. And he looks back and he says, no, you're not Avramo. He said, Tati, it's Avramo. So my father looks and he sees I'm standing next to the shiksa and he looks again and he says, Avramo, that's you. What happened to you? What happened to you? I kicked away, he says, yeah, guy, you look, you look like a guy. You, look, you, you don't even look like a Jew. What happened to you? My, what happened to my son? And who is this? He says, I told my father. He says, my father broke down crying. He says, give out. What happened to you? What happened to you? He says, my father had no place to stay, but he didn't want to stay with me. But he had no place. He says, that night was Thursday night. He came to my apartment. I told him, Tate, don't worry. We're going we're gonna to keep Shabbos this Shabbos. It's going to be the first Shabbos I'm going to keep in years with you. And I'm going to take you to Shul Friday night. 
And he says, that Friday night I took him to shul. It was the first time I saw the inside of a shul in years, he tells me. He says, on the way home from shul, in the Lower East Side, he says, we were jumped by three guys. They were trying to mug us in an alleyway on the way home to shul. He says, they didn't realize that they tried to mug the Romanian bulldog. He says, I turned around, I knocked the stuffing out of these three guys. In literally minutes, they were out. They didn't know who they were messing with. He says, but in the, in the, in the, in the hustle of things, they knocked over his father, who was also knocked down on the floor. He says, after I knocked out these three guys, I ran up to my father. I was about to pull him up off the floor, and I said, Nu Tate, you see? This is the reason why, Minashamayim. This is the reason why I was meant to take those few years, pit stop, to become a professional boxer, to save your life. Because if not for that, me and you would be dead right now. He says, my father looked up to me from the concrete and he said, I would have rather have died right here on this spot, knowing that my Avramala was a, was a, was a fine, a fine Shemr Shabbos Jew. He says, that killed me. That killed me. He says, that killed me. He says, I walked my father home. And he says, that night, I cried with my father. And I promised my father that I'll never not keep Shabbos again. I, what did I do? I had a mission and I blew it. I blew it. He looks at me and he says, you have a mission. Don't blow it. You're here to learn. I said, wow, thank you. And that's when we pulled into the Kotel. The guy gets up. Man Mountain himself got up, he goes out, he goes to the Kota. And I was stunned. And I got up from the back of the bus and I walk out and I stop and I said to myself, okay, wait one second, why did I come here to? I came here to ask the Abishta for guidance. And boy, did I just get it. I ran down those steps, I went through that metal detector, I went running out to tell this guy, you have no idea. I just hit me. But this is what I came for. And before I reached the wall, you already gave me the answer. And I run up to the wall. And he's gone. You can't miss a guy like this. With the camera. And the Dark Siders. And the members only t-shirt. You can't miss him. Not in Israel. 300 and some other. You can't miss him. He's gone. I looked for him everywhere. How far can he go? In two minutes, how far can he go? A guy like that. I ran up to the Rova. I went to the Kotel, the inside, the outside. I went to the other side. I went every... Let's go. I walked up to the wall. I put my two hands on the wall. And you know, you touch the wall as it touches you. And I said, Hey, Bishter, Bore Olam, Abba. I got the message. If you want it, you got to fight for it. And you got to make it your love. And that's this year's Kabbalah Torah. Abba, I want it again. I'm going to fight for it again. And Bezat Hashem, we're going to enjoy the taste of learning, of the most sweetest of learning, for another year, because I and we want it. That's the way you come into Kabbalah Torah. Abba, b'ten belibeinu, b'na l'havin, l'askil, l'shmo, avinu, avarach, I'm going to beg for it because I want it. I want to taste it. I want it to be sweet. Because I know once you taste that sweetness, everything else is artificial flavoring. Enjoy this year's Kabbalah Torah. Thank you for listening.